Welcome to The Authority File, the academic library podcast from choice. This episode is made possible with help from Roman and Littlefield. I'm Bill Mickey, the host of the podcast and editorial director for Choice, and we're very pleased to welcome Bobby Newman and Bonnie T. Harina to the program. Bobby and Bonnie are the editors of Protecting Patron Privacy, a Lita Guide, a book that was uh, recently published by Roman and Littlefield. Bobby is currently a community engagement and outreach specialist at the National Network of Libraries of Medicine at the University of Iowa, where she helps public libraries meet the health information needs of their communities. She's involved in uh, national library initiatives, including past service on the NISO Committee to develop a consensus framework to support patron privacy in digital library and information systems. And she was on an advisory committee for the Pew Internet and American Life Project, uh, which did research on libraries in the digital age. Bonnie is a librarian, entrepreneur, and library community convener, most notably perhaps as the founder of the Electronic Resources and Libraries Conference. She's currently a researcher at the Data and Society Institute, a New York City think tank focused on the social, cultural, and ethical impact of technological development. In that role, Bonnie represents libraries among academics, civic technologies, legal experts, policymakers, and entrepreneurs. In this first episode of our four-part series on patron privacy, we'll get a lay of the land discussing the broader digital privacy challenges, why patron privacy matters, and in the next three episodes, which we'll release weekly, we'll touch on patron attitudes and expectations about privacy, ethical considerations libraries face, and the practical side of privacy how libraries can actually implement their own procedures and policies. Okay, so before we uh, dive into the book and the issues that inspired it, uh, let's talk a little bit about how the project got started um, and how each of your backgrounds contributed to its development. Um, And Bonnie, why don't we start with you? Sure. So um, my interest in Uh, sort of considering library policy and values comes from spending seven years on ALA's Office of Information Technology Policy. So early in my career, I was an intern on that um, ALA committee. um, And the topics that they covered were, um, they were just very different from what I was doing in in sort of my day-to-day work um, and really kind of had me see the role that libraries can play in society and in their in their community. And I um, was working in academic libraries, but this gave me the opportunity to work with school and public libraries and learn about issues they were facing. So I ended up after being an intern, being on that committee for about seven years. And um, it sort of solidified my interest in issues related to um, the the role libraries play in promoting some sort of like equitable access um, to information. And I know Bobby and I overlapped on, um, on OITP, And a data and society, um, we're a think tank that focuses on the social, cultural, and ethical impact of data-centric technological development. So I'm surrounded by people who think about how technology impacts um, individuals and impacts communities of people um, all the time. So so these these sorts of issues um, are just kind of part of the the world that I live in right now. Okay. And then did... did, um the project originate with you or or Bobby, was that you? Did you kind of bring this up uh, initially? Yeah, the, the project uh, did initiate with me, um, but I I should say so grateful that Bonnie came on board. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The, you know, I had been doing work for a long time uh, around topics related to digital literacy uh, across the country, and I was involved, as Bonnie said, with the OITP advisory committee, and I had also served on a digital literacy task force they put together, um, trying to <clears throat> define digital literacy. But spent a lot of time writing and talking and thinking about digital literacy and what that meant. And when I would read, uh, you know, definitions or sort of skills that people were saying we needed to have in the 21st century or online, uh, privacy was often often left out of that. And so it was something I found myself uh, bringing into my talks, uh, you know, where maybe I was citing uh, somebody else's standards, but, you know, I felt they had left privacy out. And so I brought that uh, on board to it. <clears throat> and then more more recently, I was involved in um, the NISO's uh, project to 
oh gosh, what was the title of it? Um, privacy standards, a consensus on privacy standards uh, for libraries. And Bonnie and I both served on that uh, group. And in 2014, we did a lot of long conference calls and met in person uh, in San Francisco for two days worth of sort of attempting to hash out what privacy guidelines there should be for, for library patron privacy and trying to come to a consensus, not just between libraries and vendors, but librarians and librarians, uh, because we don't even, I think, agree uh, on all aspects of that. And uh, shortly after that, the Alita put out the call for the book, and I responded with, uh, with the proposal, which has resulted in, in the book we have now. Okay. So then how did you guys go about assembling, you know, this particular group of contributors? Um, you know, um, are these folks that you had known about or, um, you know, did you research, you know, who might be, um, um, you know, the best folks to contribute to, to the volume? Well, one, one thing that was really important to me was that we had contributions from different types of libraries mm -hmm. and different types of librarians. And that's something that I have really focused uh, on all the projects I've done in library land over the years is to try to get us out of our, you know, our silos, whether it's academic or public or special or whatever. Um, uh, some of the people I knew uh, from, you know, reading their work and being familiar with their work online. And then, of course, Bonnie is incredibly well connected and, and brought in some great people, too. Okay. And I think what we were trying to do was you know, start the book with just some foundations. So we wanted, you know, some people ask, well, why do libraries care so much about privacy? And so we wanted to start with a couple of chapters kind of showing the history and the foundations of privacy in libraries and how it actually has been an area um, that libraries have been part of, both within our libraries and um, on sort of a more national um, and political stage. Um, and also to kind of set the stage with what are some of the actual like laws and regulations. We talk about privacy as if it's this sort of like this, this sort of monolithic thing, but um, it's actually yeah. a complicated set of, you know, um, laws, regulations, policies, but also what society is, is feeling, um, you know, when, when something happens and we start to feel sort of icky about it. So there's sort of ethics around it. So we wanted to make sure we set it, we set some of that. Um, but then because this is a LIDA guide, we also wanted to make sure that we're talking about some real kind of case studies and examples, um, and sort of look at, at what's happening in some specific, um, libraries and kind of highlight people who are doing really, um, interesting stuff. So I think we tried to, look for people, like Bobby said, across different types of libraries um, <clears throat> who, are out, who are working on different um, aspects of, of privacy in their libraries. Right. And I think you've got uh, two uh, complete case studies in there in the book, right? One. Yeah. 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 We, we have two case studies. And then um, we also have a few chapters that are around um, sort of more actionable things people could be doing it, in their libraries, um, whether that's looking at um, specific tools and how libraries are engaging on social media and, and what they should be considering, but then also thinking about how libraries engage with third-party services like um, like our vendors and some, some ways to think about how to work with them. So we had some specific case studies, but then also some sort of practical um, questions and practical ways to think about um, how, how to look at sort of the different facets of um, the way libraries interact with um, privacy. And now a quick pause to pay the bills. Our guests this week, Bobby Newman and Bonnie T. Harina, appear courtesy of Roman and Littlefield. Rapid changes to technology have made library privacy more important than ever, yet increasingly difficult to ensure. Library patrons deserve to know that their personal information is safe, and library staff need to know how to best navigate this continually shifting field. Newman and Tijerina's new book, Protecting Patron Privacy, Alita Guide, offers librarians guidance on data collection and use, privacy laws and regulations, use of in-house and internet tools like social networking sites, and much more. Protecting Patron Privacy and many other books about privacy are available from Roman and Littlefield. If you're purchasing the book from Roman.com, that's R-O-W-M-A-N.com, use the promo code PPP30 to save 30% off the cover price. 
So, you know, Bonnie, why don't you just start by, you, you give us a lay of the land in terms of, um, you know, describing some of the broad uh, privacy, ch privacy challenges uh, for libraries and maybe even the public in general. I mean, um, you know, it's not all icky, as you say, or nefarious, but there, there is an awful lot of data collection going on. You know, what, what are sort of in broad terms uh, some of the issues that, that uh, librarians and libraries should be aware of? Yeah, I think really broadly, when I think of privacy, um, I, I see it as defi being defined as a, sort of the ability for an individual or a group of people to, um, to express themselves selectively or to seclude themselves if they want to or some information about themselves. So mm -hmm. when we think about privacy, it's not just, oh, there's data collected about me from, say, some website and... And so therefore I'm not private online. Like it's not that simple. I think when you think about it really simply, I understand the argument people make, well, privacy is dead or privacy doesn't matter. But to me, what privacy really is about is about that ability of the individual or the group of people to be empowered enough to say, um, I'm okay with this information being, uh, I'm, informa I'm, I'm okay with providing this information about me because I understand how it's going to be used, what the trade-offs are and, um, and what I'm, you know, what I'm getting for that. Uh, and I, you know, I understand that. And, and that's a very kind of empowering way to think of privacy. It's, it's, it's making these choices. Mm -hmm. Um, but what is actually the case is that in a lot of cases, we don't know what's being collected about us. We don't know how it's being used. Um, and we don't know what future uses may be, um, may be used, uh, with, with this information. And then, what all that collection then um, might say about me as an individual, might say about my community, other people like me. Um, and so there's, it's that part where we don't really have um, the ability to make the informed decision that I think is, is sort of the issue right now um, uh, online. Um, you know, there's, in terms of the broad landscape, you know, there's obviously, um, you know, invasion of privacy can happen from the government. We saw a lot of that sort of post-Snowden. Um, and sort of what that revealed. Um, there's obviously data being collected about us by corporations. Um, we know that not only in America, but in the world, um, that people, you know, privacy is obviously something that's important to people. Many countries have privacy laws, and in some countries, it's part of their constitution. So almost every country um, in some way limits um, or allows individuals their their right to privacy. So while culturally we may want to keep, you know, we may, you know, what we think of as as wanting, you know, what we want to keep private, what we what we're okay with sharing, that may change um, culturally or um, during different periods of time. But the definition of privacy, in my mind, I think remains um, the same. So for what that means for libraries specifically, I think libraries. Um, you know, there, there's just, again, the history of libraries um, wanting the library to be the place where people can, um, you know, learn whatever they want to learn um, and be able to do that without um, worrying about um, someone watching over them, without worrying about discrimination um, or, or um, sort of being put in a box because they're looking at that type of information. So it, it makes sense um, I, in my mind um, with libraries. But what the current issues are, are that, uh, first of all, we, we, you know, before it was simply a, we got rid of, you know, records for books that people checked out. But now we're actually a gateway providing access to a lot more information. A lot of that information is electronic and we send people off to other places. So, you know, one area that libraries need to think about and consider is, you know, what is our... Um, what is our role in, in, in informing our users when we are sending them off to other places? It's not our content in our buildings anymore. And what's our role there? So there's, um, there's sort of thinking about it that way, but there's also thinking about, um, you know, on the national stage, what, what do libraries, um, you know, what, what are, what are we advocating for, um, in terms of laws and, and regulations, whether, whether it's government surveillance or what we allow companies to collect about us and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so those are sort of some of the things. I don't know if 
uh, Bobby has anything else to, to add to that. Yeah. Well, actually I was just going to jump in. I mean, you know, with, you know, the book I think is you know, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a stake in the ground in terms of, um, you know, guidance for, for libraries and, and sort of, a um, about privacy, but, you know, Bobby, maybe you can talk about, um, you know, this sort of challenge of any book that deals with, um, topics that are attached in one way or another to technology, um, you know, that, that things are changing so quickly and it's not just a technology in this case about privacy. It's also sort of policies, laws, uh, social attitudes and norms. Um, you know, how do, how do you address that in, in this book? Yeah. So I think one of the, you know, key points, uh, or, you know, one of the really important issues when putting this book together was that, you know, obviously we didn't want it to be updated by the time it hit the shelf. Um, and that, you know, if you're trying to make a technology guide, that that's almost always going to be the case in this day and age because technology is changing so quickly. And, you know, there are uh, some really good guidelines out there right now from um, the Office of Intellectual Freedom uh, that are specific to tech, specific types of technology. Uh, and I, uh, Bonnie is going to be working on some with Michael Zimmer with a, a grant they got from IMLS. And so it really was meant to sort of be a more of a broad overview uh, okay. about that. And I think, I think too, the thing we have to think about with libraries and technology and stuff is that, you know, once people are out of high school, we're sort of the de facto education system for them. Um, you know, where else are you going to go to learn about computers or how to be safe online? And, you know, we've seen that in a, in a Pew report from a couple of years ago that, like, that's one of the key things that people want libraries to teach them is about privacy. So it's not just about our policies, which Bonnie talked about, which is really important, but also how do we uh, provide instruction and guidance for our patrons uh, in general. You just heard from Bobby Newman and Bonnie Tijerina. Bobby is Community Engagement and Outreach Specialist at the National Network of Libraries of Medicine at the University of Iowa. And Bonnie is a researcher at the Data and Society Institute, a New York City think tank. This concludes episode one of our four-part series discussing digital privacy in libraries and the recent book out from Roman and Littlefield, edited by Bonnie and Bobby, called Protecting Patron Privacy, A Lita Guide. This episode was brought to you by Roman and Littlefield and Choice. Be sure to join us for episode two, where we talk about patron attitudes and expectations around privacy and how libraries should respond. The reality is we we work with a lot of commercial entities that are beyond the ones in our industry, where libraries are not their major clientele and they're not going to you know, sit in a room and help us work on a you know consensus on um, privacy-related issues. You can search for and listen to all of the episodes of the Authority File podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, or find us on the Choice website at choice360.org. Just click on the librarianship dropdown. If you do listen to us on iTunes or Stitcher, be sure to give us a review. We hope you like what you hear. In the meantime, you can find out more about Choice Reviews and get updates on the latest podcast episodes on the Choice Reviews Facebook page or on Twitter at choice underscore reviews. Search for or comment on the podcast using hashtag the authority file. Thank you for joining us today. 